As a fan, Atlanta is sometimes hard to come to terms with. It's one of the best shows of the millennia and critically acclaimed. However, it's very hard to find a lot of other people that have given it an honest watch. It recently got the number 9 spot on the Rolling Stones moving list of the top 100 shows of all time. Atlanta is a show that sits in the top 10 alongside classic sitcoms like Cheers and Seinfeld and gritty crime dramas like The Wire and Breaking Bad. However, Atlanta has never been able to capture the viewership or fanbase size of its top 10 peers, and I'm not the only one who's noticed this. Many fans of Atlanta can probably tell you the same exact story of trying to get their friends or family into the show and failing miserably. And I think I know why this is a recurring theme amongst the fanbase. It's simply because there's no quick, efficient way of pitching the show that clearly states what it's about. Mucking? What the hell is mucking, paperboy? Man, you know what it is. I explain in the hook, nigga. One of the best descriptions of the show is Atlanta is Twin Peaks with rappers. But what if you never watched Twin Peaks? Would that interest you in the show? Furthermore, or let's say you wanted to just put on an episode of Atlanta to get someone interested in it. What would you choose as a quintessential episode of Atlanta that sums it up? The episode I would pick would change depending on who I'm showing it to, but would also require a bit of explanation and maybe another episode and, and already the magic is lost and that person is half paying attention, half looking up something else to watch. But on the other hand, this lack of clear definition while possibly hindering its growth in terms of viewership and fanbase is also what makes Atlanta exciting sell at storytelling. On the surface level, Atlanta is a surreal dreamscape that is hard to pin down with episodes that can really go anywhere, but upon closer inspection, it also has profound payoffs and implications for the main characters, even when none of them are featured in the episode. A prime example is what I believe is the greatest episode of the series, and probably one of the worst episodes to show to someone to introduce them to the characters, and that's episode 8 of season 4, Atlanta's magnum opus, The Goo who sat by the door. But first, let's talk about the speculation for this episode that took the fanbase over for a week. Because other than a splash screen for the Black American Network, or BAN, and a disclaimer for integrity, the episode opens up with no explanation of what we are about to watch. Even more so, if you watched Atlanta Season 4 week by week, you would have noticed that Episode 8 came with no teaser trailer or promotion. Typically, after every episode, they would provide a little bumper or a look at what's to come, but at the end of Episode 7, there was nothing. Throughout the week before the episode aired, there was nothing. Even the overall season trailer which shows a couple of snippets of every other episode, no clips of this one are featured. There was no indication of this episode being a thing and no early screeners went out to reviewers beforehand either. Everyone had to find out what was going on at the same time. Only the episode title was given. But of course, the title alone is enough to turn every fan of Atlanta into Benoit Blanc, and theories about what the episode would be about dominated the fanbase and the subreddit on that fanbase and the Facebook page for that fanbase. If you are caught up with Atlanta, you will know that it is a show that begs the audience to search for a deeper reference, and this title pointed to two things. The first thing is the novel turned film, The Spook That Sat By The Door, and a callback to a previous episode centered around Alfred where he needs to wear a tourist goofy hat to blend into the streets of Amsterdam while he goes on a time warping trip of self discovery that ends with him basically ODing. One of the last shots is Al wearing that goofy hat stuck in his own body as he sits helplessly by a door begging for someone to help him. And you see, for the last three seasons, there have been at least one episode centered around Al going through some type of surreal journey, and typically it always happens on episode 8. And as the goof that sat by the door was going to be the 8th episode of the final season, clearly we all thought this was going to be about Al completing that journey, but what we got was not at all what we theorized. It was better. Episode 8 of the final season of Atlanta starts with the truth and fiction. A Disney logo glides across a theater screen as a narrator lays the foundation of the documentary or foxumentary that we are about to watch. It's hard to imagine the multi-level entertainment conglomerate that is Disney could ever be close to going out of business, but the late 80s through the 90s was sort of a Disney renaissance that rejuvenated the company 
Disney's viability with the release of The Little Mermaid and The Lion King. At the same time, there was a rise in social despair within the black community, lamenting the Rodney King beating in the LA riots of 92 as de facto markers of racial tension in America. That's the truth of the episode. Those events actually happened. It was no fairy tale. In 1992, a state jury acquitted four LAPD officers on almost all charges in the beating of Roddy G. King. But the narrator goes on to say that this is when Disney also accidentally elected their first black CEO, Thomas Washington. That's the fiction. But you see, there is never a break within the truth and fiction of this episode. We are just meant to take on this information as completely 100% the truth. And many people did. I remember watching the episode thinking to myself that I am having a hard time unblurring the lines between what is fact and fiction. But what's amazing is that it completely works by bringing the audience into the world of this Fox documentary it's based on. We are introduced to Thomas Washington by an interview segment with Thomas's mother, Evelyn. Evelyn says that despite all the other boys in the Washington family being named after their father, Thomas was named after the singer Tom Jones. You may recognize Tom Jones as the singer of Not Unusual. You know, the song that inspired the infamous Carlton dance. Not unusual to me. <laughs> But you may not know that Tom Jones is a Welsh singer, and since the beginning of his career, people have always been surprised that Tom Jones is not at all black. The singer has told The Times Magazine that his race has always been questioned due to his skin tone and curly hair. A lot of people think I'm black, Tom said. When I first came to America, people who had heard me sing on the radio would be surprised that I was white. Because of my hair, a lot of black people still tell me that I'm just passing as white. So Thomas Washington was named after Tom Jones. Just keep that in your head for now because thematically, it's very important to understand the overall point of this episode. We then cut to an interview with Tom's cousin, Philip Washington. Philip talks about how Thomas was basically an anime nerd his whole childhood. Thomas loved Astro Boy and constantly drew the characters into the side of his books and homework. Understanding Astro Boy is not necessarily important to understanding this episode, but it is still a building block of Thomas Washington's morals and ambition. One time he asked me, he said, what if Astro Boy came here and saved us? I said, saved us from what? And he just kind of shrugged and said, everything. I mean, what kind of eight-year-old is thinking like that? At this point in the episode, we can start to notice the heavy use of Disney's black and white minstrel portrayals. And I mean, animation back then in general was just off the fucking wall. I just recently saw a little segment from a Popeyes cartoon and Jesus Christ. This is Thomas's nerd rising moment. While he's wanting to fit in with his peers, he can't get around the fact that he loves to draw and wants to become an animator. And his peers don't think it's cool or black enough. But his mother Evelyn instilled some important advice. I mean, he just wanted to draw and he didn't understand why that wasn't cool, you know? I mean, niggas will make fun of you for anything and I don't think Thomas was built to take it. I told him, son, one day ain't none of this gonna even matter. And in the future, Thomas does go on to achieve his goals, starting with his college years. Thomas Washington would go on to attend the Savannah College of Art and Design, or SCAD. Mark Dillard gives an interview about Thomas's drive. He shows off a flipbook Thomas made that defined his overall goal of working at Disney. Mark Dillard then introduces the teachings of Art Babbitt. Art Babbitt was one of the top animators at Disney during its early years and is the creator of the Goofy character. In so many words, Babbitt developed Goofy on a foundation of Southern Black stereotypes of the time. As we can see from his published article, The Analysis of a Goof. Art describes a Goofy. He says, think of the Goof as a composite of an everlasting optimist, a gullible good Samaritan, uh, a half-wit, a shiftless, good-natured colored boy, and a hick. And a friend of the show actually had a copy of this exact article. He can move fast if he has to, but would rather avoid overexertion. So he takes what seems the easiest way. He is a philosopher of the barbershop variety. No matter what happens, he accepts it finally as being for the best 
or at least amusing. And I was talking to my brother about this episode, and I gotta say, even though I know that it was meant in a more derogatory or racist saying, the tagline of a philosopher of the barbershop variety is dope. I'm gonna own that. Like, honestly, like, I am no longer Nine the YouTuber. I am Nine, a philosopher of the barbershop variety. Thank you very much. But all of this is completely true. Everything about Art Babbitt, everything is actually true it's there we have our hands on it and i hope you can start to see what i mean when i say this episode blurs the lines of fact and fiction making it hard to decipher what is real and what is not the episode continues with this very real forefather of disney influencing the projects that thomas worked on during his college years at scat mark goes on to talk about thomas's college creations like goofy please <laughs> which is amazing after class one day he showed me some of these pieces I, and I looked at it and I, I looked at him and I thought, this kid is from another universe, a whole nother planet. But around this time is also when Thomas's father passed away and he started reflecting the pain of that loss into his art, like the little prince. But instead of like the little prince, it's actually prince, which is kind of funny. Depending on who saw it and when they saw it, it was either the funniest thing or the saddest thing you'd ever seen. And they say, depending on who and when saw it, it was either the funniest thing or the saddest thing. And that's basically a perfect quote describing the show Atlanta. Thomas built his college portfolio with these types of projects and went on to get a job with Disney. Leonard Trussell, former Disney executive, leads us into Thomas's early years working at Disney. Things that, that I'm glad that I was able to be part of was that, um, Disney instituted this diversity program. Leonard reveals that Thomas was a diversity hire, and it's very clearly a reflection of Donald Glover's own journey in the industry. Just take a look at this interview with Tina Fey confirming that Donald was hired to work at 30 Rock while still a student at NYU as part of a diversity program. Considering that this is Donald's last directing credit of the series, I think it's clear that he channeled a lot of his own experience into this character. Thomas started off at Disney working on DuckTales while the uprising of the Rodney King protest was starting. The video of Rodney King really affected Thomas. Let me take a second to note that they are using the same real footage of the LA riots, establishing that in this alternate timeline, events happened just as they occurred in our reality. Thomas wanted to join the protest, but again, his mother intervenes with advice for his future, saying that he needs to riot with that pen and paper. Mom, I just want to go down there. And I told him, son, you need to riot with that pen and paper. At this time, we can start to notice that Thomas's appearance is changing along with his outlook on the world. He wants to make a difference in his community, but doesn't feel that he has the faculties to do so. Think Cuba Gooding punching helicopters type of frustration. But this was the moment that Thomas made the resolution that if he ever got the chance to do a movie... If I ever get the chance to do a movie around here, I'm not holding back. Thomas had no idea that his chance to make that movie would come sooner than he thought. What happened next is one of the most unlikely and unprecedented events in the history of corporate America. Due to a random series of goofy events, Thomas was mistakenly voted by the board of Disney to become their next CEO. We all voted for this guy named Tom Washington, but we didn't realize that Tom's first name was actually Thompson. To save face, Disney execs did not want to admit their mistake to the public at the height of their newfound success. We tried to handle it smoothly, but Thomas held our feet to the fire. So this is officially when Thomas is given the keys to the Magic Kingdom. All of a sudden has a ton of power at a hugely culturally significant moment. And he wants to do something with it. He wants to prove himself. This cat was on my line with some foolishness talking about <laughs> he's the CEO of Disney. And then, you know, he took me to his office and people was like greeting him. The first day as CEO, Thomas wanted to address the goofy situation. Let me know if you've heard about this or thought about this before because my guy Thomas confronts all the animators with the bizarre nature of Goofy and Pluto as characters. And uh, Mickey has Pluto on a leash and it gets real quiet. And uh, Washington goes, why is Goofy 
letting Mickey do that. He goes, what do you mean, sir? And Washington goes, Goofy's a dog and Pluto's a dog. So why is he letting Mickey do that to one of his own? This part of the episode broke me because it's just hilarious that Thomas became the top dog at Disney and his first order of business is to address the classified within the Mickey Mouse universe. But it also shows his drive and exactly where his head is. Thomas is going full radical while he's got the keys and I respect that. So now that Thomas is the king of Disney, he needs to start recruiting his team to help him work on projects. He enlists the help of some of his lower level animation peers and we're introduced to Frank Rolls. I was an in-betweener. An in-betweener was usually for animators just starting out. Say a character slapped somebody across the face. They would get a senior artist to do the fun part, drawing the first and last frame that define the movement. The in-betweener draws all the many little frames in between. Frank at first is a bit confused about what Thomas needs his help on, and this is when Thomas reveals his master plan, the movie that he wants to create, that he feels will truly make a difference. As soon as Thomas came in, he said, I want you to be lead director on this. And I said, on what? And he said, the blackest movie of all time. So for those who don't know, the blackest movie of all time is the only way you can really describe the masterpiece that is 1995's Goofy movie. Okay, so maybe you can describe it in other ways, but there have been arguments made about the significance of the movie to black millennials. He said he wanted to make a movie about black fatherhood. Man, he wanted to tackle everything in this movie. Segregation, single parenting, low income, career trajectories, fear of gang violence, incarceration, the amount of cheese and African-American diets. I'll leave a link in the description of a fairly recent video on the Laron Ritas channel that goes over all the themes of the movie and the correlations made to the black American experience. But just for a simple breakdown of the movie, I'm going to quickly pass it over to friend of the channel, Film Age Studios. Thank you, Nine, but before I get started, do you mind throwing on some YouTube-approved music? You know, something nice and easy to listen to while I fill the folks in? Oh. Oh, wow. That sounds really good. All right, y'all. Let's begin. A Goofy movie follows Max Goof, son of Goofy, on his last day of school, where he and his boys, Bobby and PJ, are planning an end-of-the-year prank that has Max dressing up as pop icon Powerline, lip-singing and dancing, all while being filmed backstage and projected to a packed auditorium, in hopes to woo his crush Roxanne and to reboot his social reputation. But due to Max tripping on a cord, he breaks through the screen to cheers and decides to put on a full performance complete with moonwalking, flying through the air while dunking a ball, then reaching out for Roxanne's hand only to be brought back to earth by the principal. Hey, it's the goof boy! We're busted! <laughs> On the other side of town, our boy Goofy is trying to get a kid to smile for a picture, and he looks like he's having fun at work until the pettiest feline in animation lumbers in, Pete, who just so happens to be PJ's pops. Now Pete starts gaslighting Goofy, but not before boasting about the father and son camping trip he has planned for PJ. When Goof says Max wouldn't go for something like that, this is what Pete had to say. Something's wrong when a kid won't spend time with his parents. Could be in some gang or stealing stuff, or causing riots. But Goof reassures him that that's not Max. As that pot of misunderstanding starts to brew, back at school while waiting for the principal, Max has a cute interaction with Roxanne that leads him asking her to a party to watch the Powerline concert, to which she replied with, I'd love to. That sends Max into a dancing frenzy, not caring about the trouble he's in. Well, looks like the misunderstanding is ready to pour. The principal calls Goofy at work, tells him that Max was dressed like a gang member, sent the school into a riotous frenzy and that he needs to reevaluate how he's raising his son before he ends up in the electric chair. Yeah, that seems a bit intense. Trouble? What kind of trouble? Dressed like a gang member. Gang member? Your son caused the entire student body uh. to break into a riotous frenzy. Riot? 
But this shakes up Goof's world nonetheless, and through a sign of a little fishing figure on a display, he decides in order to save his son, he has to take him on the fishing trip his father took him on when he was Max's age. School's out, and Max heads home through a very dope glow-up montage, getting there just as his dad is done packing the car. Max, still on cloud nine, thinks his dad is heading out on a trip only for his dreams of watching the concert with Roxanne come crashing down when his dad reveals it's a father and son trip. It's a vacation with me and my best buddy. Oh, Donald Duck? No, silly. With you! But before Max could begrudgingly accept his fate, he pleads with his dad to stop by Roxanne's, where he tries to tell her the truth. But due to her reaction and fear of losing her and finding someone else, out of left field, he makes up two outlandish lies. One, his dad knows Powerline, and the other is that he is going to be on the stage and wave at her from the concert. And with that done, Max and Goofy head out, both on opposite sides of enjoying the trip, which crescendos at a janky roadside attraction named Lester's Possum Park, whose attendees look like they're straight out of deliverance. And after an embarrassing turn of events, it pushes Max even further away. To make matters worse, the next day, while they're setting up camp, Pete shows up Star Destroyer style in an RV which I'm sure is appropriately named Climate Change Abago, which sends ripples through the plans of teaching Max the family cast. The perfect what? The perfect cast. My dad taught it to me when I was about your age. But thanks to helpful Pete, Goofy puts his foot down and forces Max to join in the reindeer games. And during the process of teaching Max the cast in true Goofy form, hooks a stake unbeknownst to him off of Pete's grill, flying it across the lake, and it lands on a giant footprint. And this is where the film takes a sharp left and we are introduced to Bigfoot. You heard me right. In this universe of anthropomorphic animals, there exists a missing link between them and what came before them. And Goofy hooks it, which sends Max and Goofy running to their car while being pursued by it. Trapped, Max and Goofy, at first frightened, soon find themselves annoyed by its presence. Bigfoot eventually finds a Walkman and proceeds to dance to Staying Alive Saturday Night Fever style. While this random event is taking place, Goofy and Max share a heart-to-heart -heart over a childhood story of Max spelling out messages for Goofy in his alphabet suit, which ends with Max handing Goofy the cup of soup with the message, Hi Dad, as he tries to get some sleep. But he can't due to two loud snorers. So he decides to write his confession to Roxanne via postcard, but as he's doing it, the map rolls out of the glove box, and this is where Max gets the idea to change the directions on the map so that they end up in LA for the Powerline concert. <gasps> How many cups of sugar does it take to get to the moon? The next morning, guilt-stricken, Max is startled, thinking that he's been found out by his father, only for him to announce in front of the entire restaurant that Max is the official navigator on the road trip. To save time, I'm going to speed through the rest of this. A road trip montage ensues of the two of them stopping at various roadside attractions, ending with them checking into the coolest roadside motel I've ever seen where they bump into Pete yet again who continues to kill the vibe. Hey Goof, why don't you order us a pizza? This might take a while. Goofy, after giving the boys pizza, heads to the hot tub and as PJ and Max eat, Max tells him what he did to the map. And Pete's nosy ass, who looks like he's enjoying this eavesdropping just a little too much, heads to the hot tub where he relays the information to Goofy, who doesn't believe him. But Pete tells him to check the map. Goof gets in the car, thinks about it, annoyed at himself for even thinking, he hits the steering wheel in frustration, revealing the map. Moments later, he walks into the hotel room, heartbroken. The next morning, on the interstate, Goofy presents Max with the map and the final choice at the junction. Left is LA, right 
the trip. And in a split second decision, Max chooses LA. This visibly makes Goofy upset, which results in them pulling over, Max kicking the car tire, which causes it to roll down the street with Goofy and Max in pursuit as they're trying to get control of their car. They both air out their frustrations as they go over the cliff into the raging river. After the grievances are aired and reconciliation on the river begins, Goofy decides to assist Max in the impossible task of getting on the power line stage. But as bridges were beginning to mend, a waterfall approaches, sending both Max and Goofy over the edge. Max saves Goofy with a fishing pole, only for him to slip, forcing Max to use the family cast to save him. In LA, Max and Goofy sneak backstage and in doing so cause a Scooby-Doo chase montage that results in both Max and Goofy both being on stage, fulfilling Max's promise to Roxanne. Once back home, Max talks to Roxanne and confesses everything that he did and why he did it. And Roxanne explains that she's always liked him quirks and all, and asks Max if he can hang out tonight. Now Max's reaction was yes, but then remembers he promised to hang out with his dad. They both agree to hang out tomorrow. Max steals a kiss. They both giggle as Goofy blows up the car, crashes through the roof and smiles. Credits roll. All right, now that everybody's caught up, I'm going to send it back to you, Nine. At this point, we could see the culmination of all of Thomas's life experiences that he's wanting to express through the Goofy movie. He's at the top of his industry and he has the ambition and power to do whatever he wants. Then we are introduced to another layer of his goals, his family. We are first introduced to Thomas's wife, Anna, and a bunch of old family pictures where we see that Thomas's progression into Goofy is becoming more and more prominent. Early in their relationship, when they didn't have much, Thomas would just sketch anything they wanted. Wanted. She would just draw it. You know, you wake up and I would see anything from a coffee maker to a solid gold jet. But Thomas's true heart and drive was for his son Maxwell. We come to find out that Goofy's son Max is based on Thomas's relation with his own son. A uh, Goofy movie was for him. He'd say, if I'm not here, you can show him this. I was too scared to ask him what he meant by that. This turns the Goofy movie into Thomas's personal love letter to his own son and also acts as a way to combat the image that movies and TV shows of that time were portraying black men. When a Goofy movie came out, black masculinity in the media was in a really weird place. Welcome to Men on Films. So on one hand, you've got men doing kind of faux queer comedy. And on the other end of the spectrum, you've got these hyper masculine portrayals. And by contrast, Goofy is a nuanced portrayal of a black man whose priority is his family. This is when we begin the interview process for Thomas's grown up son, Max. And Max gives his views of the messages that his father tried to embed into the film. And through this interview, we can see that Thomas is still holding on to the fact that singing and dancing weren't the only ways for black men to achieve greatness and dismisses that fantasy. And this provides a stronger correlation to what Thomas Thomas experience in his own childhood when he was not accepted because he would rather draw. In the beginning, Max sings a song, dunks a basketball, and then is cheered on by his peers. I think my dad was making a comment on black exceptionalism. Some people believe that performative assimilation is the best way to get by. My dad wanted to prove those limitations were just that. And I've actually gotten a greater context of the character of Max from the actual actor that played him. Maurice P. Carey came on the show and talked about his experience working on the episode and being directed by Donald Glover and the secrecy of this episode. And you can find a link to that interview with Maurice in the description below. I highly recommend giving it a watch, not just because it'll give me more clicks, but because Maurice is such an extremely charismatic guy and correlates his own experience as being a single black father with the overall themes of the episode. He has funny stories about meeting Donald Glover while working on the episode. He, this, is where, this is where he messed up. He goes, <laughs> I am Donald Glover. 
And in my head, I'm like, motherfucker, well, I know who you are. <laughs> and he's also going to be in a new movie called Chasing Rain, and he's just a great guy. Grown Up Max provides even further context regarding the story of the Goofy movie and reveals that he and his father would always take fishing trips together, which inspired the plot of the movie. He made it a fishing trip. It's the same one we used to take. So, at this point, Thomas is ruling with an iron fist and is changing the Disney structure from top to bottom in order to fulfill his message. It was about destiny and how our children, our future, get to draw our path. Frank Rolls returns to provide more hilarious lore regarding the Goofy movie, stating that the road trip map was actually made to resemble the different routes that black southerners would need to take to avoid racist towns while traveling during the Jim Crow era. Trip was supposed to start out as sort of like a freedom ride. And the map, which is central to the plot of the film and also represented Goofy's trust in his son, Max, was supposed to remind the viewer of the Green Book and how black travelers had to use it to advance their way through the Jim Crow South during the 30s and the 40s. We get the scene where Thomas is in straight tyrant mode, where in order to draw more authentic by characters, he is sending out his white animators to cookouts to be more immersed into the culture, just so they can get their asses beat for saying the wrong things. Now Tom went out on assignment, researched, hung out, went to a couple black cookouts, said the wrong thing, got his ass beat, but now, now, He's more aware. He's more knowledgeable. This is when the complaint started. Thomas refused to use Mickey in the movie because he's a white boy. My guy is starting to become mad with power and it is incredible. <laughs> I can remember Thomas ranting in his office. They're trying to make me put this white boy in my movie. And I'm thinking, oh, he's a mouse. This montage is actually comedic gold. Animators' fingers go bloody because they have to spend hours sketching the perfect dab. And I must have drawn a pair of gloves dapping, I don't know, over 5,000 times. I just kept hearing, that's not a dab. That's not a dab. Where's the snap? Presentations about properly animating black dance. You see my knees? You see this, see this angle of these knees? Draw, draw this. Get this down, OK? Just another quick plug because I had another friend of the show, animator Arthur Romeo on the channel, and he also just gave a very interesting look about his experience being a black animator and artist. And it's funny yet very fascinating how much Arthur relates to Thomas's story. Arthur has come a long way in the industry and has designed swag for Snoop Dogg and voice acted in Red Dead Redemption. The game is massive, so it's hard for me even to find my characters in that game. The guy that got like, bit by a snake in his groin and <laughs> you, have to, you have to choose whether or not to help him out by sucking out the voice <laughs> if you want even more bonus content to go along with this video you can find the interview with arthur romeo on my channel or linked in the description below We are then introduced to Brian McKnight and Sinbad giving their commentary on working with Thomas. And guys, it's actually Sinbad and Brian McKnight, which is completely wrecking my brain while trying to piece this all together. Well, when I poked my head in, Thomas went, who ordered the white rice? <laughs> and they all just laughed. And uh, I just didn't get it. But McKnight and Sinbad talk about how Thomas became a kind of fulcrum for Black Hollywood. His office was the hangout spot for who's who in the community, which I thought was hysterical that amongst all the names that were mentioned, Harrison Ford was included. Eddie Murphy, Arsenio Hall, Kadeem Hardison, uh, Harrison Ford. It was crazy. The parties were insane. I guess he just has the force with them. That's not how the force works. <laughs> McKnight elaborates on the music being used for the Goofy movie and his recommendation to include Tevin Campbell. Sadly, they didn't get Tevin to do the interview, and I really wish he did because he put out some hits as Powerline. Got 
Up to this point, the episode has been funny and trippy, but I would say this is when we get into the meat and potatoes of the overall purpose and the major themes of this episode. Although it is set in this bizarre yet familiar reality, the plot is consistent with all stories that start with ambitious men with good intentions that rise to power in that they eventually fall. For Thomas, he fell due to what I will call the creator's dilemma. Thomas now has the opportunity to create the movie he wants, a movie that is truly in line with himself. But what happens to art when, within that creation process, the artist begins to change? Or furthermore, the artist forgets who they are and what they believe in. He got this briefcase, he opens it up, there's a gun inside. I'm like, dude, what? What is this? And he's like, this is to remind me that they don't know who the fuck I am. The conflict lies in Thomas's arrogance and what he perceived to be part of representing the quote unquote culture. The brother definitely had a chip on his shoulder. He didn't like it if you challenged his blackness. This conflict bled into his personal life, first starting with his relationship with his wife. And he got pretty mean. He would say some mean, nasty things to me which he never, he'd never done that before. And then eventually his son. He raised his fist at Maxwell. That wasn't cool because they, they had always been so close. We get this old photo of Thomas with his family wearing goofy hats, the same hat that Al wore in season 3 while he was stuck in his own body and begging for someone to help. However, unlike Al, Thomas was never able to find his true self. He only slipped further into a goofy descent. Thomas's wife eventually left him and Thomas could do nothing else but fulfill his vision. But in the background, the Disney Corporation was plotting to get rid of him. Already talking about the budget was going a bit high on Goofy. And one of the guys asked Thomas, he said, uh, are you in control of the budget? And Thomas said, of course I am. I'm Goofy. And then he did this chilling laugh. <laughs> you know, like, like Goofy, but broken. I want everyone to pause this video and try your hardest to do a broken Goofy laugh. <laughs> now, imagine just inadvertently doing that in front of people at your job or your loved ones. How chilling would it be for them to see that? What madness would that inspire? And it, it was terrifying, man. I almost started crying. He really thought he was goofy. That laugh would mark his complete descent into the goof, and Disney needed to get him out. Thomas was offered $75 million to leave the company, but fulfilling his vision in comparison to money was so much grander than anything they could ever offer him. Yeah, they offered him like $75,000. No, no. We offered him $75 million. That's how that's how serious it was for us. But meanwhile, Thomas was getting into deep with other people around LA, including the Nation of Islam. <laughs> this episode is crazy. And I swear in this photo is a young Ahmad Aubrey. You may recognize him from your dreams. My name is Ahmad White. You may know me from your dreams. Also, other photos of men dressed in hats with FOI on them, which could only mean that Thomas has enlisted the help from the Fruit of Islam, which is the security branch of the Nation of Islam, and not an organization you would want to fuck with. But the movie was almost done, and Thomas was close to completing his personal magnum opus. When it came to the production of the end of the movie, Thomas insisted on having it end, with Max and Goofy being pulled over by a pig and being shot. An actual pig, that is. However, we find out that Disney has been making changes to the movie behind Thomas's back. And on the first night it aired and Thomas saw all the changes that were made, he felt utterly defeated. The end of the movie changed so there was no shooting, but most notably a scene where Goofy and Max would walk into a thrift store and find Huey Newton on the Rattan throne was completely gone and replaced with a silly scene with a Bigfoot encounter. He'd wanted Goofy and Max to wander into a thrift store and the discover Huey Newton's rattan throne. And once they sat in it, Max would finally understand what Goofy had been fighting to make him understand all along. And on the screen now is the photo of Newton that is referenced. 
And I'll read the listed description of the photo because I think it adds a bit more context. It reads, a poster of Huey Newton sitting on the Rattan throne, wearing a barrette and a black leather jacket while holding a shotgun in his right hand and a spear in his left hand. Leaning against the wall on either side of the chair is a leaf-shaped Zulu-style shield with designs of horizontal lines marking across the front. Beneath the chair is a zebra print rug. Along the bottom of the print is the text, The racist dog policemen must withdraw immediately from our communities, cease their wanton murder and brutality brutality and torture of black people, or face the wrath of the armed people. Thomas inserting these scenes into Goofy would be the conclusion that he worked his entire life to come to. Remember his mother didn't want him to go out and protest during the Rodney King riots. She wanted him to riot with his pen. His art and animation were his Zulu style shield. It was the spear in his left hand, a shotgun in his right hand, in which he would riot with. As a kid he thought wouldn't it be great if Astro Boy came down and saved the world from everything that made it ill and unaccepting. When Thomas grew up, he tried to use his art and influence to change the world through animation by any means necessary. And by random circumstance, Thomas did get the chance to riot with his pen and try to make a difference, but it was ultimately taken away. The weight of that revelation was too much for Thomas to handle, so he immediately left the premiere and drove off into the night, never to be seen again. I could feel him get up and leave. And I, I heard the door close and I went out after him. And by the time I got to the parking lot, he was gone. So I wanted to bring up something else I found interesting while I was putting this video together. I was looking through this PBS book called And Still I Rise that goes over some modern black history in America since MLK. And one of the first segments of the chronology includes Maury Turner, the first black American to have a comic strip syndicated in newspapers nationwide, February 15th, 1965. That's 58 years ago today. And really, that's not that long ago. I mean, Maury he had a crazy life before he became a cartoonist. He was born in Oakland, California, served as a mechanic with the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II, and had a job with the police department before having his art recognized and syndicated his comic strip, Wee Pals. And Wee Pals was also the first comic strip that included multiple races and was co-signed by Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts and Charlie Brown fame. And look at the Wee Pals comics. They're fucking hilarious. So why am I bringing this up? It's the tidbit that Maury, like Donald Glover or Thomas Washington, was a diversity hire. In Maury's case, he was reached out for syndication by newspapers because Martin Luther King was murdered. Nothing happened until... Uh... Martin Luther King was assassinated, and then all of a sudden, you know, the nation began to grieve, and all the newspapers wanted to prove that we're okay, Jack. And newspapers wanted to adopt an inclusive message in their publications during a time of drastic racial tension. That sounds familiar, right? And in the short segment in Still I Rise, we have this quote by Maury in which he says, I couldn't participate in the civil rights marches in the South, and I felt I should. I was working and had a wife and kid, so I decided I would have my say with my pen. Sound familiar? So making this video, I kept on thinking about Maury Turner and his journey through animation because the parallels to this episode of Atlanta are so clear. I'm not saying that this episode of Atlanta is directly inspired from Maury's story at all. I would say the opposite actually. It's just a random coincidence. And I would argue that this episode is great because it's not inspired by Maury, but still hits on all of these messages that ring true to the world we live in. It still rings true for the world black artists lived in exactly 58 years ago today. One of the last public appearances for Maury before his passing in 2014 was at the 2012 Comic Con, where Maury was a guest of honor for his contribution as a cartoonist. And I was able to find a short interview segment with Maury at that Comic Con. How's it going? Fantastic. Yeah. Beautiful con. I will be back. Excellent, excellent. I may sleep for a week when I get home. <laughs> And I wanted to include this section not only because of the correlations I found interesting with this episode of Atlanta, but also just kind of as a small tribute to the guy. A small thank you for his contribution to the world of art. And 
I hope you're sleeping easy, Mori. I do want to touch on certain aspects of this episode that connect to the overall themes of Atlanta. Essentially, what makes this episode one of the greatest in the series is what correlations we are able to draw with the other plot lines and how it fits into those plots. I want you to consider that season 3 and 4 were written and filmed at the same time, resulting in a very long wait between the release of season 2 and 3 in the manner of years and a very short time between season season 3 and 4 in the manner of months. Considering they are the same production block, you can kind of say that the final 20 episodes of Atlanta are just a doubled up season 3, or maybe thinking of it as season 3 and season 3b. I only mentioned this to add credence to my next statements. We talked about the connection to Al and the goofy hat from the third season, but I always like to return to the very start of the series when Ern tells Van about this recurring nightmare that he's having, about the hands dragging drowning him, yada yada yada, but then we get the return of this drowning motif at the opening of season 3, two men fishing when one starts talking about the ghost of a drowned out black town. We are cursed too. Oh, this whole sequence is a dream of a dream that Ern is having. In season 4, Ern meets D'Angelo who tells him to not be so sure that the hands mean him any harm. Since you were 8, you always had a dream where you are swimming, and below are hands grasping to reach you. You struggle to keep them from pulling you under. You fight to stay free. Why are you so certain the hands intend to harm you? And in episode 7 of the season, the one right before this one, Ern takes his family on a camping slash fishing trip, much to the dismay of his daughter Lottie. It was her birthday weekend and it didn't seem like she wanted to spend it camping, just like the relationship between Goofy and Max. We come to realize in that episode that Ern is over his fear of drowning and basically embraces it. No. You think she can cross that? We're just gonna get wet. It's too high. I'll, we'll get wet off to here, but... She can get on my shoulders. And clearly we can see the correlation between Ern's episode 7 plot, the episode 8 plot, and the Goofy movie whole. And I'm going to do something that I never actually do, but since the season has been over and the mystery of how the series ends is out, why not? Spoilers for the remaining two episodes of the series. In the last episode of the season, in one of the last scenes of the series, we see that Ern, Van, Darius, and Al escape some shenanigans in a pink Maserati. Most importantly, a pink Maserati with zebra parent seats, and I can't help to think about this being a way for the main four of Atlanta achieving the dream of Thomas Washington, a new age version of Huey Newton's Rattan throne atop zebra print aesthetics. But since I will be going over that in the video covering the final episode of the series, let's go back to episode 7, because something amazing happens in that episode that becomes even more intriguing in relation to this episode. Ern's daughter Lottie is told she will be going snipe hunting. A snipe Snipe is a creature in Fool's Errand. A snipe cannot be caught because it actually doesn't exist, so Van and Ern think. However, Lottie does catch a snipe, to the amazement of Van and Ern. What was that? What was that? It was a snipe. I got him. So in this Fox documentary, we see that Thomas wanting to achieve his dreams and spreading a message was swapped out with a scene with Bigfoot to portray how elusive and fantastic his vision actually was. Put in that Bigfoot bit. It's like they were saying, what you were after, your message, is a fantasy. As elusive and unreal as Bigfoot. And it may seem discouraging, but we do know that for Ern's family, they were able to catch the elusive. Their dreams and goals aren't just a fantasy. They were able to catch what Thomas wasn't. I got this night. Near the end of the episode, we are shown a tape of Thomas Washington drinking Hennessy and obsessing over his movie. The tape, which many believe, confirms that his disappearance was not some type of accident. His speech is broken and sporadic. Uh, you think his death was an accident? Next question, man. No, I don't. I, I've never thought it was an accident. Why not? Partly because of his, his mood at the end, but, um, you know, there was also the tape. What tape? I'm close. I'm, I'm close. I'm so close. I gotta finish this. I gotta finish it. 
Brian McKnight speaks on a subject that Atlanta is constantly trying to hammer home, and that's the treatment of mental health in Black culture. Back then, mental health wasn't something that we talked about. I didn't even know what to characterize what I saw him going through, what it, what it was. I just knew he was going through something, um, something that was very, very difficult for him to deal with. And I have talked about it in so many other videos already, so I won't beat the horse too much. But I think it's important to make the connection to both Al and Ernst's journey. Considering they have made it to the top of their industry, but they still have so much shit to work out. We can go back to episode 2 of the season where Ern is attending therapy sessions and is revealed that he was abused as a child and he now has a difficult time trusting the closest people around him. You were hurt by someone you trusted. Yeah. Like the family member who abused you. Yeah. Which made you feel powerless again. He lives his life out of spite. Ern's goals are not necessarily his own because he's built his life around proving the people around him wrong and using success as a form of revenge. I really need to go back to therapy. In the same way that Thomas was bullied by his black peers for being a nerd and enjoying things that are not exactly in line with the culture. He fought back against that to spread his own message but lost his family and himself in the process. Thomas is named after Tom Jones a white guy that people confuse as being black. Thomas spent his life trying to represent something meaningful for black men and culture. Ern growing up a black kid but always being teased by his friends and strangers because he talked like he was white. Hey guys, this is my white voice. Where's the blow at, man? That's how you sound. sound exactly like yourself, man. That's not like like Were you told as a child you talk white? Sometimes. Must have made you feel separate. What does that have to do with anything? Nothing, nothing. Each facet of character that makes up Thomas Washington can be linked to moments within the series in a type of surrealist poetry. In Al's case, he has lived his whole life around the culture, but while growing up, he never wanted to actually be a rapper. You know, I was never really into rapping either. <laughs> Not really. That's what I do. It's all I do. It's just, uh, too late for me to do anything else. Now that he's successful, he's having a hard time figuring out what he actually wants out of life. Never satisfied with where he is and still finds himself paralyzed by the loss of his mother. Hey, Lorraine! Babe. Huh? I need you to chill. Where's Lorraine? Your mom? This is brought to light in the first episode of season 4 when Al goes on a scavenger hunt that leads him to one of his favorite rap artists funeral, Blue Blood. Blue Blood's wife states that he could just never come to peace with his art. Even when Blue Blood knew he was dying, he wanted to leave behind something that would cement his place in the culture. He just worked so hard and I just wish he had had more fun because that's all it is in the end. <laughs> we had so much fun. But then, it wasn't fun anymore. Let's even consider Van and her breakdown slash dissociation episode in Paris. Not being able to truly know herself because she has been so caught up within the story of Ern, constantly in need to figure out her own self-worth or value, I should say. I don't even know who I am. You know who you are? outside of her partner Ern that is too insecure to say that he loves her for who she is. Van has been juggling this while still trying to be a mother to her daughter and one of the last Van episodes we get in the series ends with her telling Lottie to hold on to her self-worth and be wary of the world ahead because Van is not always going to be around to protect her. But you represent something and I know it isn't fair but what you do it matters a lot. 
I just really want you to be old enough to decide who you want to represent, okay? Because I, I can't always protect you. Much like the message that Thomas was trying to instill into his own son through the Goofy movie, and Thomas's mother, Evelyn, was trying to instill in Thomas at the beginning of the episode. Atlanta is filled with these revelations regarding the mental state of their characters without outright saying what is going on. I remember the first time I watched this, and I wondered why this episode would be placed so close to the end of the series. The only two more episodes left in its run. Don't get me wrong, this episode is hilarious and great even without digging into its overall themes, but it becomes even more fitting when you do. It's a more fitting end to the series when we consider the audience for this Fox mentory is actually our main cast. Just like the Van episode in the first season with its fake commercials and its multi-cam talk show setting, we can tell that we are watching something that exists within the Atlanta universe rather than an Atlanta episode existing within ours. And you can imagine Ern, Alvan, and Darius watching this Foxumentary and talking about it and taking in some type of message that lights a fire under them to try and change. Ern taking a fishing trip with his family, no longer afraid to drown, out realizing that growing as a person and healing doesn't stop at obtaining success, and both of them coming to the conclusion that past trauma doesn't have to dictate the rest of your life or your art. At the end of the episode, it is revealed that Thomas's car was found at the bottom of Castic Lake, the same lake where Thomas would take his son fishing. They never found his body, and who knows, he could still be out there, on his safe farm, just fishing. But then we see the crime scene investigation, and he's wearing goofy shoes and gloves. Like, what? He made the blackest movie of all time. Thank you so much for making it this far in the video. I don't have a sponsor or anything, but I do want to bring attention to a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, that's Clubhouse International. Uh, you may see that there is a fundraiser attached to this video. And disclaimer, I am on the board of Clubhouse International. So quickest pitch possible, Clubhouse provides scholarships for Zimbabwean school children. Um, Zimbabwe does not have a solid public school system, so families have to pay their kids way through grade school and the typical rate is around a hundred dollars per semester per kids we're able to do around 10 kids per semester and we're trying to get that number way up in 2023 and you know just send as many kids to school as possible so if that's a cause that you would like to support you know what to do the link is in the description below the second thing i would like to bring to your attention is the youtube channel chimbukela tv that's the other channel that i edit for and at Chimbukela, we are documenting the true stories of Zimbabwean freedom fighters during the Zimbabwean revolution in the 1980s. And if we can get to 1,000 subscribers, that would be fantastic for the cause and for us to continue doing that work. Also, shout out to Film Age Studios for helping out with this video. Please go and subscribe to Film Age Studios as well. He's also just working on a couple of different projects, some Atlanta related. So, you know, wait and see. And I really was going to dedicate a lot more time in this outro, kind of just going over a lot of other things that I know that I missed in this video, um, but I, I really just don't want to. I would rather just kind of like have you guys yell at me in the comments and maybe just start a discussion that way, just because, you know, it's always just fire in the comments. So please, uh, you know, just, just call me out there. Um, I was going to do a full breakdown of the spook that sat by the door in that movie and like how it influenced it. Um, I was going to mention how uh, Donald Glover said that you know each season would be kind of referencing a different Kanye West album and how Kanye West has recently uh, I mean kind of like for his whole career has been doing that battle with himself uh, and becoming a bit more goofy as we can kind of see in the media and everything yeah there's just so many different ways I wanted to cover this too is like I was going to get like a goofy hat and um, 
you know, become more goofy as the video went along, but I was like, I don't want to be on camera that whole time, and, and I was thinking about doing it in a documentary style, but that also just felt weird doing. Um, I thought about presenting the video kind of like how this episode is meant for the cast of Atlanta. I would also present this video like it was meant for an audience that lives in the Atlanta universe. But I sat down to write that and I was like, that's that's nothing. That doesn't that doesn't even make any goddamn sense. What am I doing? A lot of my other breakdowns on Atlanta episodes, I've always said that I would just make it an hour long if I had the time to do it. Um, and as this one was just getting to an hour long, I was like, oh, how about, you know, if I want to make these ideas work, then how about I do like two hours and put in everything? <laughs> but I'm never going to do another hour long video. If I had an editor, then I would do another video, but like editing by myself on this one just felt brutal. There's just so many different cuts and, and I love editing. I like had a lot of fun, but just I'm never going to do that again. Yo, uh, thanks to everybody that engages in the live stream videos that I've been doing. And yeah, come around, come to the live streams. If you're listening still to this video right now, then you'll probably like the live streams. Um, we've been having so much fun. We do them typically Monday and Thursday. On Monday, we've been going over The Last of Us, which has been really cool. Um, we just started off going on Dave on Thursdays, uh, making our way through season one and two, uh, getting ready for season three. Yeah, and yeah, we just have a lot of fun. Um, Oh, and of course I have to apologize to my patrons. I beg your pardon, but also thank you for patiently waiting. All of my current patrons will be on screen now, um, or like throughout the video. And um, a little bit of a callback, um, my Patreon funds are actually going to Clubhouse International. Um, it's not that much. <laughs> it's only $1 to um, subscribe to my Patreon. Uh, with that, you get early access. They're actually the ones that voted to make this video an hour long or to go extra on this video. But this has been really fun, right? <laughs> um, thank you for supporting Nine Nerd Yards. Uh, like and subscribe, and I will get us all tickets to Disney World.